Welcome back, Red Spotters. Another show you the Red Spotlight Podcast. I'm your host, Alexis Soto, joined by Peter Martinez. And we're here in April. And one of, um, I will have to say, I think this is going to be an episode that is going to um, knock out some of the final vestiges of 2021 because sometime this week, God willing, you know, barring some unforeseen catastrophe, which has been known to occur, at least as far as very derailing, I think our yeah, it's the the consistently derail our um, our plans as far as the podcast is concerned. I mean, it's already happened once this month, so just say it won't happen again. But um, we are going to be well, again. I think the biggest show that we do all year is the favorite films of the last year's show, which was twenty twenty one. And so, um, Peter and I uh, have uh, long awaited this moment, and uh, we're going to have a special guest star, Kyler, <laughs> come in. Very special also, guest star. Very special guest star. You know, it's a tradition to have him involved. Um, uh, and we're going to be talking about our favorite films of that year, and I so can't wait. Of course, also stay tuned for our programming here, David and I. Uh, convene once a week to recap the latest installment of the Disney Plus Marvel series Moon Knight starring Oscar Isaac and uh, please of course stay tuned on this uh, podcast for many of the films that are about to come out not the least of which include Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness which is just a few short weeks away and good God, all of the madness that is going to bring inside my mind, particularly when it comes to, of course, the much, um, I don't know, debated canonicity of certain shows. Evidently, there's a Darkhold castle in the movie, and there's more Darkhold lore, and I so can't wait for the thousands of articles that will be written just that weekend. Hell, they may already be written right now, just um, on the docket, ready to just publish when the, when the movie comes out to... Um, delegitimize something else so it'll be great we it'll be great so we have all and of course we have a new star wars show obi-wan stranger things also comes out in may so there's a lot of stuff a lot a lot of stuff so stay tuned uh for all that but for today we'll be discussing four films as a matter of fact we've got mass we've got come on come on by a20 from a24 the lost daughter from netflix and a newcomer Je- maggie gyllenhaal this is her first time uh, directed film and then we've got coda from apple tv plus apple tv plus of course is the first streaming service to win best picture of the academy awards yet again netflix always the bridesmaid never the bride <laughs> um that <laughs> seemingly is their fate um and then of course some news that we've got today so this is episode number 386 so peter let's go ahead and, and let's not waste any time here um with some of these uh developing stories that are coming out of course uh the podcast it brings you all of the latest stories coming out of the world of movies and i think one piece of hot uh business i guess you want to call it here <laughs> in terms of um just how bad it's gotten. I think we can officially uh, proclaim the Fantastic Beasts franchise dead in the water. Probably. Um... Because what just happened, of course, The Secrets of Dumbledore, which is the third film in this Fantastic Beasts franchise. You know, the last one was Crimes of Grindelwald, which, if you can believe, came out four years ago. Um, in I think it was the winter of 2018, and it was so trashed. It was probably one of the worst um, franchise films in quite some time of that caliber, especially maybe even the worst for the Wizarding World. So, I um, I, re- I never saw it. By I the way. recently uh, tried to watch it. Did you? <laughs> um, I got uh, a little over halfway through. I think. Uh huh. It 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 reminded me a lot of the Star Wars prequels, in that I hear that a lot. It's just a collection of scenes and characters, <laughs> like <laughs> things are just happening, and character like a, a characters just come in and it's like oh, there's this tragic backstory. I don't know who the fuck this is, but I get I don't know why I should care. But it, but it, and and it, it's just scenes happening with with characters. It feels like they can be in literally any order. Um, yeah, very 
terribly very very discombobulated i would imagine yeah. um what about the dialogue well the issue with the dialogue is it's all pertaining to plot plot and yeah. and 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 just which is incoherent yes and which is the plot is incoherent so it's like uh, um which did it have any redeeming qualities like uh, the prequels did well, see, that's what sucks. There is redeeming qualities, but I think that's what makes it worse. With the Star Wars prequels, they're so fucking weird. Because, <laughs> you know, there's there's a charm to the weirdness of it. Yeah. How, yeah. how badly it, like, the terrible dialogue. I like sand, you know, like that, all that shit. Like, there's, <laughs> the taxation of trade routes. Yes, you know? yes. We're, it's like, we're discussing <laughs> trade routes now. Like, it's so weird that there's at least, like just a, an element to it that that gives it that's like this is so weird I, I i enjoy it on some level yeah um whereas with this it's the performances are all good right like there's there's mm -hmm. there's not bad performances it's directed well it's a it's a genuinely well directed film and all the effects are well done right so 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 there are redeeming qualities to it but the redeeming qualities kind of make it so that ultimately it's a worst experience because it just feels like you know those puzzles where it's like it's a flat surface and it's a picture cut into squares and you have to like move squares up into the side and stuff <laughs> Do you know what puzzle yeah. I'm talking about? Yeah. And you have to move it and figure out how to make the picture whole. But when it's all messed up, it, it's like one picture, but just like t -t -t the squares are randomly everywhere. So it just looks like this misshapen, weird figure. That's what the movie is. Like it, if you were able to move the squares and figure out the puzzle, you could end up with a pretty picture. But it that's not what it is. And I think that almost makes it the experience worse, especially comparatively to the prequels. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's not that unique weirdness factor to it. It's just competent filmmaking with the most dog shit plot, discombobulating plot. And, yeah, and yeah, it's disappointing because. There was no need for this. If they no, had... there, was, there were a lot of, I would say, well, a lot of the problems mm -hmm. could have been easily avoided. For sure. Like, if they had just made, as we've said before, a Fantastic Beast films where it's just Newt dealing with whimsical, fun, Fantastic Beasts, um, make it a magical Jurassic Park or have it have just fucking do um see that sounds fun right that's the stuff i liked about the first fantastic beasts movie yes but then ultimately what brought it down was that half the film was about this other shit they just didn't matter it, i it, it's so much of it is just like what is this like it's like oh the mayor and there's been murders and there's this the whole thing with credence and all of that, and the ministry, that was just, yeah. and it's just mm. like, cut all this useless dumb shit out. That could be its own story if you want to involve it with the actual Dumbledore Grindelwald mm -hmm. thing. But again, as we said, if you wanted to tell the Grindelwald Dumbledore story, just do why it. not just have done that without yeah. including all of this Fantastic Beasts nonsense? It just may it just makes everything so much worse because now there's like each movie has twenty characters. I I barely know any of them because they it, it, it's all about plot and um it, it's it, there's no main character it's just no. 20 lifeless characters that you know next to nothing about it honestly reminds Which me sounds like the prequels honestly a little bit honestly it reminds me a lot of modern day Star Wars where they just throw characters oh that's true mm -hmm. and then it's it's not about growing the character it's just about Hey, this character is connected to other shit and this, this, and that. Like, like it, it's, it's that. It's just that. 
Like um, the, the Disney Plus live action Star Wars series. Yeah, for sure. And it's honestly, I I think the best thing that could happen, the best thing, and it won't. I want to be very clear, it won't. But the best thing could happen for this Harry Potter franchise is to do another film, Harry Potter film, like with Daniel Radcliffe as Harry Potter and the and the gang and all that. But don't do um, Chris Child. Cursed Child. Create an entirely new story. Don't mm-hmm. Force Awakens that shit, but do an entirely new story um, with those characters, how many right. years on from them. Let me backtrack a little bit here, uh, just to make sure everybody is informed of it. So, this past weekend, um, Secrets of Dumbledore um, came out, and we should be, you know, again, full disclosure, this did receive a B-plus cinema score, which is, I would say, not bad. Um, again, this is this is um, from the audience that went to go see it. Um, and it did receive better marks from critics than Grindelwald did. And many people actually were calling Secrets of Dumbledore the best um, out of the three Fantastic Beasts films. So there were some positives um, with, with this movie. That being said, this film still cost them $200 million, and it is the single lowest um, opening weekend for a Wizarding World film. All the Harry Potter films and all the Fantastic Beasts films included. The low point here, uh, Secrets of Dumbledore opened to $43 million. Um, and this is also, again, a steady decline. I believe um, Grindelwald opened in the high 60s, and then also um, the first Fantastic Beasts opened up in the 70s. So this is just like more evidence of just steady decline. And $43 million is pretty, pretty bad and kind of embarrassing for the Wizarding World franchise, one of the most popular franchises to have ever existed across media, across the world. It is such a big, big franchise. And for this film to open so low, yes, of course, pandemic still, but also it's you can factor that in only so much, of course, where while other films are opening bigger than this, that's your first indication. And then, of course, you have the track record. This franchise is just opening lower and lower and lower. The interest just doesn't seem to be there any longer. And mm-hmm. I can't imagine now at a time when, by the way, new leadership is now taking over the entire studio. I can't imagine the new guy in charge... Um, David Zaslav, but a lot of people have called him Daddy Zaslav, hilariously enough. But I can't imagine that guy, um, being like, "Yeah, we need another Fantastic Beasts movie." It just seems the economics just don't add up. Two hundred million dollars, this opening being forty-three million dollars, that's bad. It's very bad. <laughs> um, yeah, and and I guess my thing is. My biggest wonder is because I, 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 no one cares about these films. That's why no one's making them. The the Fantastic Beast films specifically, and it just does make me wonder because Harry Potter, like I said, is supposed to be W one of WB's big crowning franchises. They can't just let it die. Not, no, not no. like this. Hell no, they can't let it die. And again, I feel. Like, the only way you can get your groove back with this franchise is if you were to do another Harry Potter specifically. Let me tell you that. I I, I both agree and disagree with that. I think, like, mostly... I think the idea that you threw out there is spot on. And if that would... I think it would work. The problem is, I don't think that's an option at the moment. Yeah. I also think another great idea is I, look as far as this story with Grindelwald and Dumbledore because and this is where it kind of gets a little awkward here right because when the first Fantastic Beast movie came out WB or at least the, the 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 executives or the producers from the franchise itself the Fantastic Beast franchise they were telling the press by the way this is just the first movie in five movies 
Oh, well, that's that, this is where it gets embarrassing. That's not mm-hmm. going to happen anymore. That's just not going to happen. This probably was the last film of this. Um, and you're going to get cut off short from like what your plan was. Okay. I think the easiest thing they can do is HBO Max. HBO Max, they need programming. A Wizarding World show on HBO Max would be pretty fucking big for them. Obviously, you can cut the budget they had in half. You can finish the storyline through on HBO Max, either with the same actors or do something else entirely. But if you want to finish out this particular story to its conclusion, you can do that on HBO Max. And it probably would be the best way to economize, you know, this loss. However, this is where it all, it seems to me that the biggest problem (laughs) with the Wizarding World franchise is WB doesn't have complete control of it. They don't have complete control of it because J.K. Rowling is still very much in their way with any decision they would like to make with this franchise. Again, this is the same person, of course, you know, J.K. Rowling, the creator of the, of the books and was a producer for all the films, insisted on the fact that she try her hand in screenplay writing with all of these films. And what a disaster it has been. WB should never have allowed themselves to let her run these movies. Because look, there are a lot of problems with the films. Yes, conceptually, that was probably its biggest issue. Yes, there were a lot of scandals involving several of the stars in in this franchise. But ultimately, look no further than J.K. Rowling herself as your primary suspect to blame. There's no... And again... Nobody should feel bad about that because, you know, well, technically speaking, the whole her anti-transgender takes have nothing to do with, like, her um, ability in crafting a story. That has also been another scandal that has derailed this entire franchise, right? But still, J.K. Rowling is responsible for this particular series failing, and honestly... For tainting the entire brand. And at this moment, she's taking this entire brand down with her. And it seems to me that the time has come to remove her from the equation. I, legally, I don't think they can. Can they buy her out? I don't, if she were I don't willing? think she'll sell out. She's not one of the ones that will go for it, right? Mm-mm. And that's why it's like, to me... Unless you're able to convince her to do the things that you suggested, Peter, I don't, which I don't think this is going to improve unless you remove her out of the equation. Yeah, no, I, that's the thing though. I agree, but I also understand like, it's just not happening. Like her, it's, you know what it is? I mean, maybe right now it's a George Lucas moment. Like, Mm -hmm. this is after, uh, you know, the success gets big, J.K. Rowling, it's like, oh, this, she's, she's the master of this world, da, 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 da. And then they go on to try and make more and more stuff. They be, they, the, the person becomes obsessed with the lore and they make incredibly lore heavy, um, prequel films. And it's this thing of like, this is their and books this is their baby no one's going to touch it um i mean that's what happened with george lucas and stars until i guess bob Iger convinced him to sell mm-hmm. uh i don't know for four billion dollars i obviously um uh, wb already has the rights to harry potter and stuff like that the film rights mm-hmm but they're except for the fact that a lot of, again I don't think I'm wrong when I'm saying like every decision they've made so far has had to have gotten the green light from JK Rowling. Yeah. It's it's it seems as if she still has especially legally so much um control when it comes to these projects what gets made, how it gets made, who makes it etc cetera, etc cetera. and but but the difference is i i genuinely just don't see a way out uh jk rowling giving away that power 
I don't see it. Um, so that's why I said the best case scenario is just a Harry Potter movie number nine. Oh. oh, sorry. With the old cast coming back and a new right. story because the cursed child was doo doo. And here's a th- here's another problem though is um not only is J.K. Rowling insistent on like every decision being ran by her, her name is still in the credits. Like she's still an executive producer in everything Harry Potter made, and it seems very much so. And this is kind of a unique situation because no one really turned on George Lucas as far as his his own talent, mainly because he's not a transphobe like she is. And publicly now, a lot of people, including Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson, have really like denounced J.K. Rowling's transphobia and have said they're not going to come back. And I can't imagine them coming back with, with her involved. Yeah, but that's why I think the only way you could get them back is with a really good story. You hand them a really good script that they feel... That's not written by J.K. Rowling, and would she even allow that? Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, not not thought up in any way at all by, by with the mind of J.K. Rowling. Just someone comes in, writes a really good script about uh, a story that, that takes place again all these years ago. Harry Potter story. You can... That's To me, that's the best case scenario, right? It it'll it'll be something that'll attract the talent back. You cut off all your um, what do you call it? Your ties to J.K. J- ties to J.K. Ideally, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's even feasible though. Like, I mean, she still have she would her still name get the, there. She would still get the money, right? Yeah, it should still technically be like a producer or something along the lines some sort of story credit maybe story, even, I don't I, know. maybe not story well creation credit you know created by character based on characters created by jk rowling um but yeah it's that's the other issue though it's like even though yes like um all you're saying is correct this franchise has continued going and going and going, and she's had singular control and singular voice. She's not let any new voices um, go and tell their own hair, like Wizarding World stories. She doesn't even have like new people like come in direct the films. I think David Yates has been directing Harry Potter films since like two thousand what five. It's just his whole career now directing Harry Potter films. Something needs to change. He's not bad at it, but like. Don't you want to do something else? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a steady paycheck. Yeah, like, I don't even know if there's any, like, extra material or novels or stuff like that. Because you look at even, like, something like Star Wars. Star Wars had always had people come in and write comics or write stories or do this or do that. Novels. Yeah. I, I can't... I don't think of a... Every, everything connected to Harry Potter is just written by her. Yeah. Which is... Ridiculous. Even website entries. Yes. Um. Yeah, that's why it's so unlikely to me that she'll... That she's really made it impossible to get rid of her. Yeah, I don't think she'll relinquish any kind of power in that department. <sighs> well, I'm glad I'm not a fan of this franchise. <laughs> then because i i would be like really like frustrated with this entire situation because clearly she needs to go and she's not going to and i don't think anything can really improve if that is going to be the case yeah so that is where we are with it but speaking of warner brothers so david zaslav from discovery is now in charge of the company because the merger with discovery is now complete we all love mergers right here god damn I'm so sick of mergers. But anyway, um, Warner Brothers Discovery is now the name of the new company. And yet again, Warner Brothers happens to find itself under new leadership for like, what, the thousandth time in five years? It's <laughs> yeah. crazy how often things have changed here. But previous, I think, um, what's his name? Uh, Jason Keelar and Ann Sarnoff, who previously ran, are now, they're out. So here we go Bye-bye. again. We got, <laughs> here we go. And um, 
One of the um, fascinating um, elements, or I would say maybe even threads that have come out of the merger being complete, at least as far as how it is being covered, uh, I think it was the Hollywood Reporter that actually had this story, which as far as like some of the changes that are now going to be taken into effect under Zaslav or the Zaslav regime is DC Films. Now, if the thing is with, with um, DC Films, it's just the name of like, we're all, I guess, production wise for all the films that have come out, but like really it's all for all these last well, forever and ever, DC Films is just Warner Brothers. It's just the Warner Brothers studio and the Warner Brothers machine, and mm-hmm. as you say. And um for years and years and years, people have been think have been saying that, that how Warner Brothers should handle DC films is give it its own p- output or its own vertical, where they're given like a branch of creative heads and then they run their own stories and everything well it seems to some extent that's going to be one of the changes where dc films is going to be made into its own vertical but it's not going to be necessarily all that independent i think at the moment walter hamada is the president of dc films but it's really like it's more of a wait and see situation um where if Walter Hamada is ever going to be like, let's say the chief creative officer, like a Kevin Feige, where he is with Marvel studios. Um, I think Zaslav from the, you know, articles that have come out has said that, or at least the insiders have said that there is a dissatisfaction with how DC films was run and that certain heroes, signature superheroes like Superman have been left to languish. Basically, a lot of the potential capital, a lot of the potential opportunity, it was just not being taken advantage of to its full potential. And now it seems like there there is a desire to have more of a cohesive, cohesiveness with this um, going forward. While, by the way, still mm-hmm. retaining... Um, the um the flavor that they bring to comic book films that Marvel Studios does not have. I think they singled out like Batman and Joker as being examples of uh some of the stuff that they still wanna make that's not necessarily um what Marvel Studios seeks to make. Mm-hmm. Um one thing that I think is they're just absolutely true is this idea that they do sideline characters that are important, like Superman. Um, he's been did so dirty, man. He's been so... It's it's insane to me. WB, if there's one sign that WB has mishandled the character of Superman, it's, okay, he had, you know, his films in, like, the fucking 1970s. Uh, they, they did a, a semi-sequel... In like 2005, which kind of didn't go anywhere for them. Reboot in like 2013 that I, I'm i I'm going to be real. I don't care how many um, people on Twitter or the internet try and say differently. They didn't work. That people <laughs> didn't. <laughs> didn't like. People do not like Henry Cavill's version of Superman. People didn't like that movie. Otherwise, we would have had Man of Steel 2 and 3 yeah. by the year 2020, at least. People didn't... didn't. Guess what? People didn't like Man of Steel. People didn't like Batman v Superman. And no. people didn't like, like Justice, Justice League. League. Um, uh, Superman as a character has been insanely mishandled. Um... <sighs> In, insanely so i do think so insane right. to the point where from what i hear the brightest material from superman in the last decade and a half is currently airing on the cw superman and lois yeah i've heard a lot of good things about that show um i you know what tv shows i it's i gotta wait and see and by wait and see, wait until the show's fucking finished and then maybe watch it. Well, CW, I mean, it's a good bet it's going to be on for a while, I would assume. Like, yeah. The Flash is, what, just finished its eighth season? And people were crazy about that first season, too. And then... Mm-hmm. 
Well, you know how that went. Exactly. Yeah. So, TV, especially cable TV, uh, yeah, very touch and go, wait and see because of that. But, yeah, this whole idea of, like, you're sidelining some characters, agree 100%. Now, this idea of more co- cohesion, eh, I... In a sense, I might agree, but in another sense, DC has recently been putting out my favorite shit. Okay, I think the Batman is fantastic. I think the Suicide Squad is fantastic. I thought Peacemaker is was fantastic. I thought Shazam was fantastic. Um, Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn. Um, uh, Aquaman. These are films that are all very, very, very different. They do feel very dis jointed and separate from each other but I, well, in some cases they are they are literally with the batman right but it is this thing of like i don't care i don't care this is this has been the best comic book offering you know i it's i'm in it's vastly if you take those films i mentioned vastly superior to marvel's recent output <laughs> it's just vastly more, it's just interesting they're yes, interesting because in all of those films, films, they take different risks. They different. They take different chances, mm-hmm. and they all offer like their own flavors. Whereas all of the Marvel films, save maybe one or two, are the exact same flavor. Yes, and thinking about that, um, at the same time, they're saying that they want more cohesion. They're also saying like, oh, but we really want to invest, and we really like. Things such as the Batman and Joker and Aquaman. And it's like, what? Why did you name these three? Why did you name these three? They're the ones that are making a fuck ton of money. That's, That's right. Those, <laughs> those three. So what they're the re- Suicide Squad unfortunately didn't make money. Yes. So the reason why they singled out those three is because those three made money. So what they're really trying to say is we want to make movies that make a lot of money. And Wait, can we, by the way, can, can we like not move on from the fact of the craziness that the Batman right now, there were a lot of things going against it. A recent surge of COVID, the fact that it's literally going to be put on HBO Max tomorrow, like 45 days after it's like debuted in theaters. And all that's keeping it like underneath $800 million. But an Aquaman film made over a billion dollars. Over a billion. I just love that insanity. <laughs> so I guess for me, it's like, You say you want more cohesion, but you're also saying you want the individual films. To me, what it says is we just want money. The reason they want cohesion is because they believe the MCU makes all the money. So they're saying we want to make money that way. And then the reason why they're saying these uh, we want films like this one isn't for any particular reason artistically it's because these are the movies we have most recently re- released that have made the most money so at the end of the day the only message they are saying is you know um, mr crab's impression i like money and <laughs> i just don't see how that that specific approach is any different than what wdb was doing before um, yeah, well, I guess the only difference I can see is that them recognizing that certain characters have been sidelined and now they're not going to sideline them mm-hmm. and look for ways to bring them back into the pop culture zeitgeist. In many ways, the you can, you know, I guess read in, in between the lines here, they want to emulate what um, Kevin Feige did. And I guess that's the like that, that that is a model of success. My concern, I share the same concern that you do, is I don't want the interesting flavors and the weirdness and the quirkiness to go away and just get another MCU. Yeah, I don't want another MCU. I don't care how well connected it is. If it's bland, then it's not worth. Now, if I guess the dream scenario is they maintain you know, the level of creative vision, you know, film to film, Mm -hmm. and that you organically interweave a connection there. Mm -hmm. I guess to me with the cinematic universe, and my issue with Marvel now is 
there are no longer individual stories. Yeah. Now it's just one long continuous story. Before in, in phase one, that was the dream scenario because like you had individual films be their own thing. And then you had a movie that ended up bringing those heroes together for its own storyline. Whereas now you have a storyline intercutting in between films and TV shows. And it's like, there are several examples now where, you know, characters in the Disney plus shows or in films, um, are like robbed of big character moments in service of like advancing the overall cinematic universe storyline. That's mm. not what I want to happen with DC. Yeah, no, I agree. That's that's exactly the opposite of you would what you would want to see moving forward. I mean, you could, again, like you said, the best case scenario is very very loose connections. Just allow them to make. Uh, the films that great filmmakers want to make with loose enough connections for the audience can go like, yes, I see how that this is all in the same universe and, you know, maybe build up to towards something because that's kind of important. Um, like I said, you could just do something as simple as have King shark show up in Aquaman too, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, and it's like, yes, this is the same world. Um, uh, I, I, of course, you also have the Batman, which is an entirely separate world. But also, I don't care because it's a good movie. Like, I yeah. would be down with making a Superman film, but as, like, a period piece. Maybe, yeah. like, the 1930s when it first released. Like, it's just make a good film. Is Matthew Vaughn available? Right? He'd. Be, I think he'd be fantastic for a Superman film. I think he'd be great. Um, I, I've been pretty high on the WB films as of late, mm -hmm. and for the foreseeable future, I'm it. That's gonna continue because, you know, we're gonna get Shazam, uh, the Batman two, um. I am interested in to see what Flash has to offer and Black Adam did the previews of it did look fun. Did look good. So it is this um back and forth as to whether this merger means anything good, but if it does ultimately mean I'm going to get an actually good Superman film once in my lifetime um I guess it'll be worth it. And it ain't just that too, because there are other heroes that it's, been, it's, it's time. Like there is still a situation about what to do with wonder woman now, because, and that's, yeah. that's kind of a precarious place because the first film was beloved and it, and it was a box office success. The second film could not be a box office success because it was released mainly on HBO max. And if you did see it in theaters, that was at the, during the pandemic when there were no vaccines. So you take that out of the equation, but the film 84, Wonder Woman 84 was derided. It was, it was just wasn't good. Yeah. And then, of course, evidently, Pat, Patty Jenkins will come back to do a third movie. I don't know what the demand there is for that. I guess it could be good. Who knows, really? But, like, I don't know if Wonder Woman can take another disaster in, in, a, in a third film. So there's that potential fiasco. And then there are other heroes that just haven't come back into play. Like, well, it's hilarious that it's taken them. Remember, it's, I think I don't think it's a. I know things happened, but they announced a Flash movie. It's taken in them almost a decade to to release a Flash movie. They announced that Flash movie in 2014. Yeah. It's going to come out in 2023. Yeah, it's that's not good. Also, where's Green Lantern? That yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity there for Green Lantern. Mm -hmm. I that I want to see a Green Lantern movie. Yeah. And I mean, maybe capitalize on these characters that have grown popular because of their TV shows. Maybe right? do a, yeah. maybe do a Green Arrow film. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, because while I'm I don't care about the show, mm -hmm. the comic uh version of Green Arrow, uh, he's a cool dude. He's like, uh. <laughs> He's 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 kind of like a a, a socialist. 
Uh, <laughs> he's very, um, he's the hippie Bernie, Bernie Sanders of the group. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's a very cool dude. And I think it would be, you, you can do a movie with him. Um, yeah, there's, and there's other characters, DC characters. Oh, yeah. Um, again, I, fuck the show. Let's see a Teen Titans movie. Yeah. Fucking do it. Like, like, um, include the theme song because that shit rocks. Theme Titans. I know. You know, you know what's interesting? And I don't know why, why, honest to God, what's standing in the way. But considering the fact that the original Teen Titans animated series on Cartoon Network was so popular, Mm -hmm. and considering that it concluded on a state of that lacked definitely closure, inconclusiveness, shall you say, for the most part. I don't, and I, and granted, of course, Teen Titans Go has been very successful on Cartoon Network and for what it is, sure. But you've got HBO Max now. You're looking for people to subscribe to your service. Hello. Why not just go back and do more seasons of that show, Teen Titans? You've got the voice actors that still do Teen Titans Go. It's like what Disney Plus is doing with the X Men animated series from the, from the yeah, 90s. and that's from the that's from way later back in the day than yeah. um, than when Teen Titans. Teen Titans went off the air. So I mean, yeah, I think that's such an easy slam dunk. Uh, like you, I mean, they brought back Futurama. I mean, it's they just they just bring the shows back yeah. and we're continuing as if like the conclusion never happened. Yeah. But with Teen Titans, there was no conclusion list I can recall. So, go back. It was such a cool show. It really was. I that I don't understand what's standing in the way of a lot of these. Yeah, it really is. Like, mean, why can't you do? I know the Flash has been on the CW for like ten years now, almost ten years. Why can't you do a Flash animated series? Hello, like what's happening over there? So. Yeah, there's a lot of things happening. So, there is that. Before we move on to the reviews, um, can we just mention real quick how much of a behemoth Turning Red has become? And no, not just for the insane memes that are out there or the absolute insanity that has taken film Twitter by a storm this past week. Because evidently there was, like, somebody took um, a snippet of somebody else's review who evidently was being serious about like their take as to this, this criticism as to why turning red did not comment on the events of nine 11, <laughs> considering that it takes place in 2002. And of course the memes do <laughs> what the memes do and has taken that as seriously as it needed to be taken. So there is that, but that's not what I was talking about. Talking about the fact that the Nielsen streaming numbers have come in and it has, you know, against the wishes of people who made of the people involved in the film and against people like us who would like to have given the chance to have seen this in the, in the theater still would. Mm-hmm. The numbers don't lie. They really don't. And what has come back from them is the film collected over 1.7 billion minutes of views in just the first week. You want to put that in the context? Squid Game, which was one of the biggest successes of 2021 on Netflix, collected 1.6 billion minutes of viewing in four weeks. Turning red in one week collected more views than the phenomenon that was Squid Game did in four weeks. All those views could have been um, a homophobic and far-right groups, you know, combing through the film <laughs> to, to, to make sure their child isn't being groomed. Um... And I just wanted to take a moment to consider that and to praise it. You know, one thing that did slip my mind, Peter, uh, it kind of got lost in the shuffle. I don't think you and I ever really addressed the controversies that um, that were being directed at Turning Red. We talked, to, we were gushing so much about the movie. I don't think we ever really get in, got into 
Um, this we had to have at least a little. Bit. I don't. Uh, I think we touched it, but I don't think we got into the whole idea of like there were people who were <sighs> this. You know, included some critics, and you also saw it widespread all online about people not connecting with the movie overall, which in my experience, and I'll just get into it right now since we're on this film, one of the things that uh, was in my What We Saw This Week was Turning Red. Of course, I um, am a substitute teacher, and one, I was in a class this week, and we watched Turning Red, um, and the kids loved it. They were singing the songs. They were <laughs> they they did not struggle to connect whatsoever, and that is the intended audience of an animated film by Disney and Pixar. And so the idea of like this film being so hard to connect with, it always seemed kind of foolhardy to me. But then I think it was it, I think it was apparent. It was pretty obvious why certain people weren't connecting with it. Yeah, and I think it was more of a commentary on them than it was in the film. <laughs> yeah. Um. I mean, obviously, this film is a massive, massive juggernaut, like you said. Yeah, definitely a a phenomenon for children. And it's obvious why. It's cute. It's funny. It's very well, it's well great. made. It's it's a great, great film. And much in the way that Luca was, which at least we forget, was the uh, according to Nielsen. The single most streamed film of 2021. Yeah. Um, they need to chill out, though, because that means we're never going to get a Pixar film in theaters again. Well. If they keep up. They are not going to yoink Lightyear, that's for sure. That The one. The <laughs> one that they won't do that to. Yeah. I wonder why that one they will insist on having a theatrical play. Mm. Gee, could it be perhaps that it is co connected to an intellectual property that's already like so well known, whereas Luca, Turning Red, Soul were not? No. It's got to be something no, else. No, it could not be. <sighs> Nevertheless, you can't argue with the results. I guess you could see how much Luca and Turning Red have done for Disney+. Plus. Holy shit, these numbers are massive. Yeah, it's huge. Like, huge, huge, huge. I mean, you also, Encanto. Encanto blew up because it was on Disney+. Plus. Maybe that's why, um... Because didn't I hear recently that... What's her name? The the director is, is now part of the... They promoted her in some way, like... Which director? Of Turning Red. That they promoted mm. her to, like... Member of the, like... Board... The, the 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 story not storyboard but it's something Dami she yes yeah I think yeah she Pixar promoted her to a leadership role yes yeah yeah leadership role yeah mm -hmm. um I, after the so I'm uh, at some point recently they saw the numbers. Yeah, and they're like you're getting a promotion. No, but I think that's cool. I I actually really like the heads of Pixar right now. Mm -hmm. I think they're doing a good job. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm, I'm thank really... you, Pete Doctor. Thank you, Pete Doctor. Mm -hmm. And also, at least for forget Disney Animation, Jennifer Lee. Yes. um, is doing great. Fantastic. So, yeah. Um, it's just like I was um. I was watching these kids really connected this to um, these movies, and I was just like, man, you know, I had great animated films um, at that age, but they were mainly from the past. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the early 90s yeah. animated films. I guess to me, like, if you think about, like, when I was coming of age, Disney animation wasn't great. Like, I think it was, po I think it was at the time where, um, coming of age as far as, like, I mean, like, I'm going to say what? third fourth fifth grade like more than just like being a, a toddler and a young kid like it was just that Pixar. was it, well yeah that was it yeah but we sure as hell didn't have the accessibility they, they do to watch it whenever they want fucking lucky bastards anyway there is that uh can we get into by the way stranger things um yeah had a, a trailer which oh my god i've like seen a thousand times and you know me, I don't do trailers. <laughs> Usually. 
Um, so this was, I, I saw it, it was there and I'm like, okay, I have to make time sometime during the day to like watch this. I saw it and I'm like, can I start watching this now? Um, I actually recently, we, we watched the series late last fall, like all the first three seasons. So I have the whole thing fresh in my mind before I would assume everybody else that hasn't seen it recently. It's been three years since the last season. So you're going to have to probably some people have to go like rejog their memories. As to all the stuff that happened. But um I love this trailer. Um it's um both hilarious and um well it, it actually is I think mostly hilarious how much the kids have aged. This is what happens when you wait so many years. Yeah, they <laughs> um, to, they waited way too long. They yeah, they kind of did, but um I loved a lot of um, the visuals. I love the horror elements in there as well. Um, it seems like a focal point of this season is going to be that haunted house. Uh, that That's the same house that we saw in the teaser trailer a few months back. Yeah. I guess it's a good trailer. Mm-hmm. It's a very good I, trailer. I, 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 wait, I know where we're going to go with it. I'm not done yet. Oh, oh, um, oh you know. Hold on. You know. I know okay, go ahead. Go <laughs> yeah. Ahead, go I, ahead. I, I, yeah. Um, what was it? Real quick, uh, this is where it's a little bit of a different take. So, as far as like how they're treating the season, mm-hmm. they're splitting it up into two parts. The Duffer Brothers have said that each episode is going to be at least an hour or over long. There's like twice as many episodes now, so they're splitting that up into two parts: volume one and volume two. And for how I don't know if you got this impression, Peter, because it's always been a question of like, is this the last season or not? If you watch this trailer, you'd think to yourself, this kind of seems like the end game here. Yeah. Well, remember, I, I, we had an argument where I was like, mm-hmm. isn't this the last season? Because they're really making it seem like it's the yeah. last season. Because they but literally not. said the, be- the beginning of the end yeah. or something. And it's Every like- ending has a beginning. And so I think what I'm, what I'm getting off of is that season four is the beginning of the end. Because mm-hmm. season five is definitely happening. It's like, this is basically Infinity War. <laughs> I guess. And season five is end game. So I think this is like this whole like Stranger Things 4 is setting up the end game here. Because I mean, if you look at that trailer, it's like you get the things are wrapping up here like this. We're we're right. We're ramping up to the ending one way or the other. And at least for me, before you get into, I guess, your overall feelings and what I would assume are potential negatives here. What did you make of I, to me? The thing that keeps going back the image that has stuck with me is that creature. And I can only assume is the physical manifestation of this upside down. Well, see, that's what I wanted to get into is that I love season one of Mm -hmm. Stranger Things. And I really enjoy season two and season three. Um, But it does feel a little bit of like, okay, but what's the forward thrust you know, what's the forward narrative? Like, what's the through line? Yeah, what's the through line? What's the end game here? What are we leading to? What, what yes. Um, because, you know, the first time it's the upside down, it's this sort of parallel place, and it's like, oh, it's a Demogorgon. Cool. Got it. It's this creature from another universe. Um, and then the second one, it's like, more demogorgons that were connected through the mind flare which then becomes the focal point in the third season yes and then it's okay the mind flare which is this other entity. entity we don't really know it's this entity and then that was the really big one that... for season three mm-hmm. technically although you don't really hear him speak it's mostly that it's like a bigger, it's a big monster thing, you know? Or, or no, it's like the body snatchers. They snatch them. Yeah, but they then, explode. Yeah, but it, they do ultimately become this creature thing. Like, what? what is, what's how, uh, it does feel a little bit like, oh my God, this crazy thing happened. Oh my God, this exact same crazy thing happened again. Oh my god, this exact same crazy thing happened for a third time. Is there a through line? Mm-hmm. 
Is there a point to all of is this? Is there a point? You know, what is this, right? That that creature thing looks really cool and it speaks, which I also think is great. Is that the mind flayer as a human? Was the mind flayer completely defeated? And if so, what was the point of every I don't I don't know. I think I have I think I have like at least to me. I think I have easy answers to your your okay questions. okay i think the entire time um so i uh, my impression from this trailer and this creature that we see here this i would say pretty effectively creepy creature clearly is i think a signal to us as the audience this is the final boss if you will um i it, it was not my impression that the mind flare was an entity that was destroyed i think he, like his his connection from the upside down to the act to our world was cut off repeatedly in all of the seasons um i think in season two the demogorgon uh the demogorgons were definitely all connected to the mind flare now i don't necessarily know if the one demogorgon we got in season one was also i would have to assume it was but again i'm just trying to think for myself here i think the mind flayer was what we saw in this trailer i think it's all this guy here Mm -hmm. like it was him the entire time and he is the force that is trying to break through i'm not um it could be that what came before were all minions of this guy or that they're all one in the same I guess the worst thing would just be like, he's an entirely separate thing that has nothing to do. Oh, I don't think that's with, it. At okay, all. okay. No, no, I don't think that, that would no. be very annoying and, it would and be. dumb yeah. to me. Where it's like he's just this random new guy that popped in. I'll tell you this: the vibe that I got off of him in this trailer felt very much like. Um, that post credit scene in Age of Ultron, where Thanos goes and says, fine, I'll do this myself. Maybe. Maybe. I'm sure there will be some revelations of, of sort. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's my that's sort of my main a- apprehension of like... Right. It's a wait and see kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I mean, Any other than takeaways? that, it's, it's a fantastic trailer. <gasps> that song! Oh yeah. That's oh my god. That was so effective. I was like the the cues and the song was oh jeez. But you know also this trailer was a reminder of like how kind of like massive the cast has grown because geographically speaking we're kind of all over the place here. Like it seems very much that a lot of the the, the cast is going to venture into the upside down. But at the same time, we got to keep in mind that Will, Eleven, um, Jonathan, and Joyce were relocated. And it seems – it wasn't, I think, overtly made clear at the end of Season 3. But um, what's his name makes it clear that they were relocated by um, Dr. Something, um, who we see here talking to Eleven. Um, so they're all splintered off. And it also looks like – what's this, what's the guy – what's the journalist's name? The, that that's friends with with Joyce and with Hopper, um, but it it seems like they're on a rescue mission to go get Hopper in Russia of all things. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be interesting how all that um, plays out. And then there's this thing with Max who is levitating in the trailer, um, and I'm kind of scared <laughs> about what that means. Um, and also Eleven still doesn't have her powers back because she lost them at the end of last season so just a couple of things that have like that come into play that just to catch people up on on where it is um any other things that you've got to say about this trailer that makes you wonder about where it's all gonna go no that's sort of the main thing just like Mm -hmm. i don't want it to have been like okay we had a great first season that's kind of a self-contained story Mm -hmm. we ran in place for two seasons but now this, this is something else entirely, and it's like, oh, you would you prefer is that the whole thing is connected as it was before? Yeah, for sure. And I think that's what's gonna happen. So I, I think that's 
I'll put it to you this way, Peter. At no point did I ever think what you what you are apprehensive about. Mm-hmm. Like I don't think that's a question about that. It's I think it's all in line. <sighs> Maybe um, if you get time, go back and watch the first three seasons again. Since I mean, it's gonna come up in you know in a month. Yeah, that's true. It's a great rewatch. I'll tell you that. Like I, I mean, to me, I I love all three seasons, and I love them all more uh, when I rewatch them all together. So. Yeah. Cool. All right, Peter, let's go ahead and get into what we saw um, this week. So I just finished today on my uh, Easter um, schedule today. What I chose to watch was um, what was available for the behind the scenes features, um, which, by the way, we should mention, of course, I mean, you and I are collectors of physical media. Mm -hmm. And part of the decline of physical media, as far as the quality of physical media, is like this, the the deterioration as the the offerings for bonus features. I mean, again, last week we discussed how Sony inexplicably just removed the deleted scenes from one of the bonus uh, features for the Blu-ray disc, and that's unfortunate. But what uh, seems to be one of the rare exceptions is uh, West Side Story. Oh. Wow. Um, yeah, no, there was basically a full-length documentary, about an hour and uh, 40 minutes, um called the stories of west side story um and featuring extensive behind the scenes footage of um filming basically the largest numbers from the film um which again it's it's talking about more than just like oh you know this is how we film this but like actually getting into not just from like from one or two people, from like a, a myriad of different people connected to the uh, to the film, talking about like why they shot it this way in terms of like a story choice, or why they, you know, they put the song in this position, or why, or how the lyrics are reinterpreted here. It's just a great fucking watch. Um, if you get time to see it, it's available on um, on our movies anywhere account. Um, you could just put the play all feature, the stories of West Side Story, and it's just like there's you see interviews with Rita Moreno, Stephen Sondheim, uh, Tony Kushner, uh, all of the cast there just to get insight. It's just like wonderful moments stick out to me about uh, when Stephen uh, told Rachel Zegler that she got the part, <laughs> uh, and how like I think she she screamed like holy shit to his face, which is hilarious. Um, yeah, it's just, it's wonderful. And it's just crazy to see like 75 year old Steven Spielberg, like still go at it hard. Like you see a lot of him like being a director. Um, and I think that's like one of like, to me, one of the more fascinating aspects of it. Like you get to see how he actually makes a movie, um, and how he still, moves and gets with it (laughs) with him being 75 years uh and you see that the you know on the outside the man has age but on the inside he's still the same guy um at least the magic for making movies is still there and i loved it i loved it so much uh it was one of my favorite behind the scenes features i've seen in a long time and this comes from the same guy that directed the making of the Indiana Jones um, trilogy. Oh, really? And the Secrets of the Force Awakens documentary um, that came on the Blu-ray. So this guy has made a couple. He also made the making of Jaws. Um, also a Close Encounters one. So, um, yeah, it's very good. Very, very good. Very insightful. Uh, a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff with Stephen Sondheim there, who, of course, you know, um, passed away late last year. And it also made me think of like, you know how when we discussed that um, Jason Reitman, is that what it was? Or Ivan Reitman. Mm-hmm. Ivan Reitman passed away earlier this year and we were happy that he had to experience like one final thing in his career where like one of the things he was most known for was Ghostbuster getting a revival and that his son was making it and that the storyline in and of itself was very much a father-son thing. Or, you know, it was, you know, evoking that. And it was wonderful that Ivan was able to like live his final days with like reliving how what it was like being with the first Ghostbusters and getting all these people excited about seeing the movie. The same can be said with Steven Sondheim. 
um, in his final years, like going back, because evidently like he was there the entire time they were like filming those scenes. Oh yeah, um, he was... giving notes, rewriting lyrics, and very much into it as well. No, he was working hand in hand with Spielberg to uh, mm-hmm. make the film. No, yeah, I agree. That's incredible. Uh, that yeah, it sounds cool. Just the whole documentary itself, mm-hmm. really giving insight yeah. to all that. Yeah, and it's about time. It's been a long time since I've had one of these. Um, because I I buy a lot of Blu-rays, but they a lot don't of them do don't them. have much of anything. Yeah, not anymore. I remember those DVDs. Oh, my, they used to be chock full of special features. Mm-hmm. Now it's... The spoils of riches. Yeah. So is that? And then the other thing I saw uh, this week with the same kids I saw uh, turning red in class was Luca. Mm. Um, and I had not seen it in months. And it really, really reminded me of like how much it resonated because when it got to several scenes toward the end, I got to be honest, like I was really kind of glad that the lights were turned down. Oh, I, no. No, I was holding back so much emotion, shall we say, and I had to be careful here because, of course, like the kids were there. They were like second graders. Mm, um, I had another live. Um, but they were like they weren't looking at me. They were looking at the movie. So like that wasn't going to happen. But I had to be careful because like I was getting so moved. I was like because every single thing and every single scene was like making me so like, wow, this is like just really powerful. Uh, of course, like one of the things about the film is like the power and its simplicity and its message and just even the individual moments to the characters. Um can't wait for next week oh no <laughs> yeah yeah unfortunately it just missed my top 10 i'm kidding no well we'll, well see we'll see yeah. right well, we'll <laughs> see right yeah we will see um but um no i was like i was thinking to myself alexis you gotta you better not cry here <laughs> keep it together <laughs> not in front of the second graders no no not that so, uh, but I mean, it was fine. I guess that it was their last day before they're on spring break right now. So oh, good for them. You threw a movie at them to like, keep Just them, keep them occupied till the bell rings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. Hmm. And thankfully it worked. Um, and it's also just fun to see, to experience like, um, these kind of films with kids. Cause like they comment along with the movie and they, they they're just like, they're so invested with it. They, they, it's just great. It's like so. you're, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, when they test the film, market yeah. market tester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it kind of felt that way. That's true. That's true. Uh, and by the way, um, they um, a lot of the conversations involved Sonic. So you're right, man. The kids love Sonic. Kids adore Sonic. I don't know why, but they do. Sonic is. They just... had Sonic toys. Some of them. Yeah. They they were saying like, did, did did you see Sonic two yet? It's like, whoa, wow. I don't get it, but cheers to them. <laughs> Paramount's gonna be making like Sonic movies to the end of time now, probably. It's, yeah, they keep making a shit ton of money. Jim Carrey is gonna be. He's gonna have a steady gig for like what every other year now. Yeah, <laughs> it's the only movies he'll have to make. He'll. Yeah, I think Paramount Three is already like no Paramount Three. Paramount's already greenlit like uh, Sonic Three. Oh, for sure, yeah. As if that was any question that was not going to happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, like seventy-one million dollars. It's crazy. Um, and in and, and its first dig, I should say. So there is that. What did you see? <laughs> <laughs> You've been busy. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. It's it, it's been a long time. Well, uh, should we just go ahead and get to the movies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did you want me to read any of them? Or you... Yeah, so, um, do you have any, do you care which one we start off with? Uh, no, 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 no. All right, let's go ahead and get into Mass. All right, man. Uh, let's go to Letterbox to see what uh, their wonderful description, which I, I should say, I guess, for people who haven't seen the movie, there is kind of a big twist in here, so we're going to try, I mean, does it, I don't know if you want to. Like, not talk about that, but it is kind of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I guess uh, potential spoilers ahead, obviously, since we're talking about these movies. But, yeah. Mass. Mass. 
directed by Fran Kranz. Face your fears. Two couples meet for a painful and raw conversation in the aftermath of a violent tragedy. Doesn't that just sound wholesome? <laughs> the sound family like movie of the year. <laughs> uh, it is anything but. Cast is Reed, Bernie, <laughs> and Dow, Jason Isaacs, and Martha, Martha Plimpton. Plimpton. Yeah. I mean, I think we've, at least I think I did when I, I don't know, maybe you did too. We did talk about it a good chunk, but um, just to reiterate a few of the points, um, it's a good film. It's a very good film. It took me by surprise. Oh, yeah. Not only what kind of film it was, because the film really is just a conversation. Yeah. With between four people. Um, it is four people in a room mm -hmm. talking, and that's the whole movie. The whole movie. That's it. Um, it's it's genuinely great. I I found it genuinely engrossing. I was powerful in, in yeah, moments, man. I was into it the whole time, right? And that's pretty difficult, obviously. When it's a just a film about four people talking to each other in uh church. It's a sustained conversation. Yeah. It's one conversation. The entire time. It's yeah. just going and going and going and going. Um Yeah, it's a film that in the beginning I don't know if I would have thought much about it, and by the end, I had absolutely made a emotional connection to it. Mm-hmm. And I found it to be, like I said, very engrossing, very engaging. And, um, it, it's, it just had, it left such an impression on me that I didn't assume it would from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. Um, uh, ultimately I was like, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the film. Mm -hmm. Um, again, uh, no, I, I agree with every word of that. A lot of, since a film is basically a sustained conversation, I mean, it, it really has to have great dialogue. And Fran Krantz had amazing uh, lines to give um, these actors. And again, they can't feel like made-for-movie lines. You know, it no. has to be powerful, but it also has to feel genuine. It has to feel like it's actual, like, normal people discussing um, what happened to them and everything. And that's a fine line to walk while still, like, setting up powerful moments. Um, the performances also have to be pretty damn good. They have to be that at the, at a bare minimum. And all four of our leads here in, and not all of them gave the, like the same performance. They were all very much different. Um, they came at it from different perspectives. Um, and if, but I think all of these were powerhouse performances. I think if the Academy Awards, quite frankly, were an institution that prioritized seeking out what were the best of the best in every category, instead of like, who do we know the most and who do we like the best and whose time it is, Reed Burney, Martha Plimpton, Ann Dowd, and Jason Isaacs should have been included in the list of nominees for best acting. Mm -hmm. All four of them. Some of the best acting performances of the, the entire year are here. And they kind of break you in some subtle ways and in some others pretty overt ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, the, I mean, this film just hinges on the actors' performances. And they I thought they were all incredible. Um, special shout out to Jesus, Jason Isaacs. Um, yeah. Yeah. I and again, I, I, I mean, they were all great. Yeah. Uh, in moments, I was like, "Whoa!" Like, uh, and Dowd um, had some moments in there as well that were like, "Damn." Um, so I mean, I, I loved it. I, I thought it was pretty fucking great and powerful. And I think, um, I know the subject matter is not something that people would go out of their way to see. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm, I'm, if you got the time, this is kind of a must watch to me yeah no, no no yeah it's it's definitely a dour film but um it's... but it also can show you i think what potential like 
growth slash closure slash resolution that could come by people just sitting down and talking over their issues. It ain't going to be a perfect answer, and that's not what this film is saying. But I think ultimately it lands on the idea that there can be some kind of resolution if people sit down and talk over their differences with each other. Yeah, yeah, it, it's 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 a very dour movie, but it it doesn't have ultimately a dour message or even ending. There there, there mm-hmm. is sort of um it it's there is hope within the film, but very much so, especially when you when you get to the end and some of the confessions and so, so you know, stuff like that. Did you want to get into any of those like particulars that that stick out to you? Well, no, 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 because I, I think the whole... The whole thing hinges on that surprise? Yeah, yeah basically, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it's kind of like, whoa. <laughs> Unfortunately, I knew that twist because I had like had it spoiled to me in like some other conversation. This is what happens when you're like when you're in the awards like punditry like when you watch these things mm-hmm. like oh some things will slip here and there so I knew that's what it was and honestly that's what intrigued me about it but you didn't know no. that was ha- happening How, what was it like when you realized that's what was happening here well I I had suspicions just because I mean, it's not that they try to hide it in the dialogue it's it's clearly deliberate by the film that you aren't supposed to know up until a certain point, but the way that it's written, it, it, it's very well done. It, it's not like people are, are avoiding saying specific things in order to keep it from the audience. It's just like, it just hasn't been brought up yet. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it starts off tense, starts off weird. There's this, you know, vague notion to a tragedy, but they can't, you can't really begin to understand what's happening until the characters themselves understand and open up a little bit um so it it honestly worked really well for me (laughs) to just Mm -hmm. and it, it, it touches on so many um well it touches on hotly debated political issues in today's day and age uh that are loosely related to the tragedy and it also showcases how the parents um reacted in different ways were treated in different ways what they did you know post a tragedy um and there is this moment that kind of caught me off guard at the at at the very very end Mm -hmm. there was a moment that was surprising yeah before it before it closed oh yes yes yeah i think i know what you're talking about yeah i think it's like one of the lines of the film Mm -hmm. and that's just really really just sad and tragic but then powerful and ultimately let ends in an embrace an unexpected embrace at that mm-hmm. um it's a beautiful movie i mean it is it's, it's heavy material to, to obviously that it's deal with and by the way while you don't see anything they go into explicit detail about what transpired in this so-called tragedy um where you can picture the images yeah no it's it's wild Mm -hmm. so um it is a must watch so that is mass now um let's let's maybe um lighten things up (laughs) with coda coda um is uh well if you've been following the news it was the film that was proclaimed uh the uh Best Picture uh, by the Academy Awards, and then also Best Supporting Actor for Troy Kotzer. Um, yeah, uh, currently streaming on Apple TV+. Plus. So right now we'll go to Peter, who will pull up the uh, letterbox description for CODA. CODA. Directed by Sian ha- Heater. Sean. Sean Hater. Sian Heater, yes. Sean Hater. Yes, Sian Heater. Okay. Um, every family has its own language. As a coda child of deaf adults, Ruby is the only hearing person in her deaf family. When the family's fishing business is threatened, oh no, Ruby finds herself torn between pursuing her love of music. Oh, of course... The girl with a deaf family loves music and her fear <laughs> of abandoning her parents. Um, 
<laughs> it's definitely a cute movie. It's it's very nice. It's a nice film. You know, you, you ever see a, like an old person like, oh, that's a nice boy. He's a he's a nice boy. Uh, they, 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 that's that's this movie. <laughs> Oh, it's a nice movie, you know. Recommend it to my grandma or something. Um, but I think that's the extent of how I feel about the movie. I think in most ways that's all you can feel about the movie, really, because there really isn't much more to say about it, right? Like, I think yeah. really, as far as the film itself is like is concerned, what transpires in it and like what kind of it makes you, how it makes you feel. I mean, very much it, it makes you want to feel one kind of way, and that's how you feel about it. I mean, again, I guess to just like because we haven't mentioned it so far, but of course, Coda does stand for Child of Deaf Adults, and by the way, I think it's it is a plus. It always is a plus that a um a community such as the deaf community that has obviously been one of the many communities or minorities shall we say that have been pushed in the margins or that have been marginalized it is great that they get to have a film like this that brings a spotlight uh and shows that they in fact do exist and that's a positive thing it's always wonderful where films are able to really do that and the fact that a film was so showered with praise and accolades, shall we say at that, uh, to a film that represents proudly this community and reminds people that they do in fact exist um, is a good thing, ultimately. And that is the power of representation. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that perhaps is the film's greatest contribution. And I'm so happy for the people involved um, that were exposed to all of the amazing press and praise that they received. So happy for them. Um, I liked the film. I I felt yeah. all the feels. I thought the performances were good. Um, and I thought it was like, you know, when you read the description, perhaps you'd think it would be kind of like sad, but it really isn't. Mm. It's kind of sappy, which I'm not opposed <laughs> to sappy. Yeah. You know, for yeah, the most of course. Yeah. And it also is kind of like, in moments, pretty fucking funny. Um, like they're like they're um because I guess like you never would think like uh two deaf parents engaging in sexual intercourse and not I guess they wouldn't care how much noise they make because they can't hear anything, could they? <laughs> That's so, true, yeah. So like there that are moments something. in there it was something, right? Um Yeah, like and I, I, I honestly I don't think anybody gives a I think everybody gives a really good performance here. Um, but at the same time, like what you said, it does have that grandma movie or mom movie effect, right? Where it's like very much something akin, as far as the subject matter is concerned, to what you would find on Lifetime or Hallmark. It's like one of what one of those movies. Yeah. But I don't. But that isn't to say that it's like. I mean, I, I personally, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Some people would. Mm -hmm. I don't because I, I do think there is inherent value in those kind of films. Um, and I do think ultimately what this film is, it touches people. Um, and that's what film can do. And that's great for that. And I think for me, I was definitely moved while watching it. Yeah. I would say I think it's the biggest failure is it just had and I, it, with me, it, it may not be with anybody else, but with me, it just hasn't stayed with me. I, I don't think about this immediately after I see it. And so therefore it doesn't really, I don't live with it. It's just kind of, I saw it and that's that. And the only reason I have bothered to like go back and think of the movie or think of it is because it was brought up so many times that it ended up winning best picture, which honestly maybe the worst thing could have happened for the film's legacy. Cause yeah. now it's like, it, this is a nice movie. It's a cute movie, but like now it's a best picture winner. And it's like, what? Yeah, you took what uh, was a nice movie, very cute movie that everyone you know enjoyed, and was like, "Oh wow, you know this this is a this is a feel good movie," and then you made it into a villain, into a villain basically by uh, <laughs> trying to uh, I I don't know um, get um get by getting a, a best picture, giving a best picture, yeah. Um, but 
I I try not to let the reputation. Now I don't. I guess it's not reputation. History of the film, or what? To me, it doesn't matter what rewards it is or isn't getting to. Right. Yeah. Um, no. What people are saying or not saying when it comes to the film, it's 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 always what did I think? What did mm-hmm. I feel? Um, what did I see? You know, whatever. And ultimately, it's. It's a cute movie. It's yeah. a good movie. Yeah. Um, and that's all I can say. Yeah. And that's, it's not, it's okay to just be good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. That's, that's, uh, yeah, that's basically it. So if you want to go see a, uh, a good time, watch Good Time. Feel good. Yeah. Well, yeah. If, if you want to see a feel good movie, there's Coda for you. Okay, trying to segue into a feel good, I think it's also feel good uh, quality to it. Shall we go into Come On, Come On? Come on. Another film distributed by A24 and happens to star Joaquin Phoenix, not wearing clown makeup. Also, <laughs> nowhere near the, the conversation. Come uh, On, Come On, directed by Mike Mills. Johnny and his young nephew forge a tenuous but transformational relationship when they embark on a cross-country trip to see life away from L.A. This is also kind of like Coda, where it's it's a very cute movie, but I think it also has a little bit of extra something that Coda lacks, which is commentary, right? Yes. Which is also um, an exploration of something that... Um, isn't quite entirely said in the text, but it's definitely implied. Um, and it kind of gets you thinking in ways perhaps Coda can't. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. It's, uh, I don't want to say it's like a one-to-one in its uh, cuteness or heart when it's, you know, similar to, um, the last one. <laughs> What are you talking about? Coda. Coda. <laughs> I'm sorry. Man. Uh, Peter's dying here, guys. He's really trying to power through this. I'm sorry. It's, I, 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 it's not your fault. It's 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 been a very long day. Um, and <laughs> I'm so- okay. So I'm starting from the beginning. Okay. <laughs> Don't laugh, you stupid son of a bitch. Uh. I'm at like, like 25% uh, brain Am I doing capacity. a podcast with Diane Feinstein or something? It's like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm not literally a corpse, okay? I am not Diane Feinstein. <laughs> I'm not being weekend at Bernie's to you. Um, <laughs> but the difference between, I think, Come On, Come On and um, Coda is that I think Coda leans in a little bit harder into the the feel good sappiness. Whereas, mm-hmm. come on, come on, this feel good. There's obviously cute and and certain levels of humor. Um, but I I agree. It, it, it's there's a little bit more complexity to it, and a little bit more of um, it feels a little bit more like a, a film. <laughs> yeah, it ain't so sense. simple. What happens here, as yeah. far as the, you know, the subject is concerned. Mm-hmm. Because ultimately what we have here is with Joaquin Phoenix, um, he his personal life isn't necessarily in the best, but his professional life is definitely like flourishing. He is called to assist with his sister uh, and very much is said several times kind of estranged because of the um, – well, for several reasons, but like they evidently had a disagreement or they didn't have a great time with caring for their dying mother recently. But um, he is called to assist in taking care of his nephew, you know, his sister's son, while she needs to go take care of her ex-husband, who is um, not doing well health-wise. And Joaquin Phoenix's character here, um, I mean, just inherently speaking, there's already a lot that kind of like makes me kind of relate with him. It's like, like he's very much like thrown himself into kids. his... Per- well, I'm getting to that. Well, because 
he throws himself into his professional career very much as interested. I mean, personally, I mean, what he's doing, I've done, which was conduct interviews, like record people, you know, ask them for like a documentary or for, you know, for research purposes. Like what the work that he did here is what I've done several times mm-hmm. over. Um, and then he needs to go and spend – it's hilarious because like he's like interviewing children. But now he has to go take care of one, mm-hmm. one who he doesn't necessarily like know all that well. And um, that can be a daunting task. And I think one of the things that made me really relate to him, it's like with me, I have no formal training as to how to care for children, much less educate them. Much less like and yet, them. Yes. And yet my job requires me to do all of that. A job which, you know, kind of like was interrupted very much so by COVID and, and That's true, only yeah. recently only recently returned to it and just having to find my way and how to do this again and how to do it well and also how to connect with them as well. Because like I – some and I, that's one of the things that – one of the struggles that Joaquin Phoenix has in this film is just trying to connect with his nephew. Um, and he finds in surprising ways the ability to do that but not, you know – through some trial and tribulation there. And that's just kind of what like I had to do myself. Like there are some things like kids tell me and I don't know how to respond. Yeah. They'll do that to you. My initial reaction is like, I don't care, but (laughs) I mean, I don't say that. Like, it's like, okay, how do I say this and sound like I'm interested in what they had to say? And then also, but then they'll surprise you and they may even come up with some like thought provoking stuff there. And I think it, it is kind of a struggle with him in this film um, to where it's like he really wanted nothing to do um, with the kid. And then by the end of it, it's like, again, like it could have easily gone over the top. Yes. Um, with like, let's say the, 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 what happens in the ending, but it's very much restrained. But you know what's happening, like the internal emotion that's going through. Hmm. And I thought that kind of made that all the more powerful. Like I, I honestly really, really enjoyed this film and kind of like on a profound level, um, <laughs> kind of spoke to what I was going through a little bit here and kind of the ultimate crux is like, well, do you have kids? Do you not have kids? And if you do, <laughs> this is, will this happen? This probably will happen. Like, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's a thing. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, I definitely agree with everything you said. Um, I thought Joaquin Phoenix gave a wonderful yet subdued, which is okay. Right. It was other about the uh, performance. Um, I agree with the complexity and yeah, this, this idea of tying to like, I, people, I would say I've always been, I think a very patient person. I think I have a lot of patience and I've always, um, liked kids. Like, I, I feel like I've always been good with kids. You know what I mean? So I'm, uh, I don't connect so much in this, like, oh my God, I to get this kid fucking away from me. Um, I I don't. <laughs> That's more. <laughs> yeah. I don't necessarily connect in that same way that um I'm sure a lot of people do when it comes to the idea of of just taking care of a kid, especially when it's just thrust upon you. Um, but I will say the film I think puts does a really good job of explaining. Um, Joaquin Phoenix's story and his point of view. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and why, as someone who it, it would not compute to like just be like, fuck this kid, I get where he's coming from, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, that because that's it's just more, it's complex, slightly more complex storytelling, right? mm-hmm. which might, you know, bump it up a little bit higher in my estimate comparatively to like coda Mm -hmm. score is great by the way um and i I love a lot of um the moments that are intercut with the kids that because some of some of the some of the commentary in this film um is with um you know kids being asked about what the future would be like um and that's always fascinating to hear and i think uh, scripted as it may have been they felt like genuine responses yeah so definitely worth a watch. Come on, come on. Speaking about um, children, um, <laughs> and, you know, people handling that. Our last film, 
The Lost Daughter, starring Olivia Coleman, directed by Maggie Gyllenhaal, currently streaming on Netflix. Peter, our letterbox description before you pass out. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I just realized I was typing in the name of the movie into Instagram instead of letterbox. <laughs> Oh my god. Make sure you have an energy drink or some coffee when we do the uh, top 10 show because I mean we are expecting at least 3 hours. But the, t- today's Easter, man. I was I've been I know t- no t- no today's yeah, an exception. It's, 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 yeah. it's I worked yesterday. It was a whole thing. Mm. I guys I've worked late. It's, yeah. You know. I mean Easter might as well be, might as well have been a working day for you. If, oh my god, yeah. Um, it's, it's you know it's it's fun it's great but it's tiring clearly okay so the lost daughter directed by maggie gillen being a mother is a crushing responsibility <laughs> you tell me about it a woman's seaside vacation takes a dark turn when her obsession <laughs> with a young mother forces her to confront secrets from her past. Now, oh, wait, I forgot the cast. Okay. Olivia Coleman, Dakota Johnson, Ed Harris, and Peter Skarsgård. I like to include that. Uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal, director, writer, producer. Uh, I will say this. After having seen this film, it is... <laughs> uh, Let me see. I don't know if she has children, but if she does, that would be incredibly funny. <laughs> Wait, Olivia Coleman? No, uh, Maggie or, Gyllenhaal. Oh, Mal, oh my God! I don't written, you know what? produced, I don't, I don't directed. Know. I don't know because if you if you were to look at this movie, go like, God damn! Is there something <laughs> you need to tell me? Do I need to leave right now and we just never talk? Again, to be fair, this is an adaptation. I'm not sure if you oh, realize that. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, but what, like an original... what brought her to it saying, like, I gotta make this a movie? Well, she loved the book, apparently. Uh, um, uh-huh, uh-huh. If I was the kid in her house, I'd sleep with both eyes open. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, take away from this film. Um... I think uh, this is like uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal really trying to um, direct in some ways. You can make the argument over direct, but I I don't know if it necessarily crossed in the realm of like unnecessary to me. Yeah. I liked I liked the stylings that she she um, gave the film. Again, it's kind of like split up because we have um, Olivia Coleman. Then we also have you forgot to mention. Oh, there was somebody else because um and she was very important uh she plays the younger version of olivia coleman in the movie um and she is played by um uh, jesse buckley no. and she also got an academy award nomination this year for this role for best supporting actor really yeah i wouldn't have guessed it either but she was that's so okay. weird that's kind right, of kind a random of, okay yeah but that yeah that was there so jesse buckley uh, plays uh, the character in the past, and then we have Olivia Coleman here in the present. Um, both, uh, by the way, I think the performances all all around were pretty pretty good. Um, in particular, though, it's just a reminder: Olivia Coleman is one of the best actors out there. Yes. I I love her in everything she's in, and there are moments, several moments in this movie where it's just like. Holy fucking shit. The thing she is doing here is so fucking complex, and yet she's delivering it perfectly. Yeah. And I feel what she's feeling right now. No, no, no. I, you cannot sing the praises enough for Olivia Coleman. If she had won this year, Best Actress, I wouldn't have complained. No, me neither. I thought, I thought she, was, she was really good. I mean... Oh. And she's already won, by the way. <laughs> oh, Best yeah. Actor. That was a great... Um, because she, she was so excited, I think that right, was a win. F- yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it called? That it was. She will. She won for the favorite. The favorite, and that yes, was that's right. that was an upset win because everybody was expecting Glenn Close to win for the wife. That's right, because they never gave it to her after being nominated five hundred times. Mm-hmm. Very funny. Um. 
Yeah, I, it's it's this as a film. I don't think I'm in, in love with it as much as you are. Mm-hmm. But like I said, it could just be different strokes, different folks, because right. I had um previously said how it's like, yeah, I don't I don't have it. I, I like it and I don't have I don't have that mindset that Olivia Coleman's character does. Well, no, I don't either. No, no, no. I, I know, I, I know you I, don't yeah. either. <laughs> Um, but it's 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 just more like if I were to rank yeah. them of the four, I would say that um, Lost Daughter is the third film, the third most film I liked of the of this group of four that we just reviewed. Really? Yeah. No, I mean, I I I like I really like three out of four of these. Um, like of the films that we just discussed. Mm-hmm. Um. The thing with Lost Daughter is it's um I mean it's intentionally cold in moments, but I'm oh, not yeah. sure I would say like I'm like all the way in love with it. Like but I do like the film quite a bit. And in particular because I love Olivia Coleman in this as well. But it I think it also to me <sighs> Yes, I think it's pretty much the anti come on come on, because I think with come on come on you could make the argument that at the end of the day it can be worth Yes. Worth to have struggle. kids, yeah. This movie, it ain't. <laughs> it comes, I think. It comes into the complete. Everything. It comes in the complete opposite, but I don't think that's like without value here because mm-hmm. I think like what you see is a a move a, a person that like is broken because she she hates herself that she is so happy. That she was so happy mm-hmm. to be away from her kids, and that's something it's I'm not guilt. sure we've seen. Yeah, like in film, all that. No, often. no, no, you don't. Because why? Because it's just it's that societal expectation. It's like, well, of course you want kids. Of course you enjoy being around children, and and of course this, 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 and that. And then for her, just her, so much of her guilt wrapped just wrapped in the fact that she's happy being alone away from the children that she's created um that that's um it's different you know it, it's not your everyday average hero that you would see something like and that. i think that's why people reacted so negatively um because there was like a broad obviously this is on netflix mm-hmm. there are a lot of like there's a stereotypical netflix audience that necessarily does not re- respond well to artsy films like this in particular but i just think because society has such a frigid, um, you know, I guess role for women yeah. and and their relationship with children, it's pretty simple to understand why so many people would kind of like react in disgust with like, I guess Olivia Coleman's behavior in this movie. Mm-hmm. Even though I would say, again, the film is. Like, again, I think like the the case that it's trying to make is that obviously she would have been far happier if she never had kids, mm-hmm. but she still feels terrible that she feels that way. Yes, guilt is the mind killer. Mm-hmm. I thought it was fear. Oh, well, fear is the mind you know, killer. Potato, potato. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so, ugh, God, it's like there are so many moments where she's like has to like. She's got to be brutally honest, and, and she's got to convey two emotions at once. Like she's happy. I'm, I'm not sure she has she has any regrets, other than having kids. Mm-hmm. And she hates herself for that. And you see it played throughout several times. And like, um, I mean, it's not exactly a fun watch, that's for sure. No, no. But I think, but, but I mean, I, look, let's be honest here. Like, life is complex, and I think like and people a are film too. like. That's but that's ultimately the point. It's like, mm-hmm. look, what works for you doesn't work for the person next to you. Yes, right. And I think ultimately there are so many forces that includes the Catholic Church that ultimately I think included the Pope, a Pope by the way who, by and large, I've agreed with in terms of like the commentary he's like provided uh, with political issues. Mm-hmm. But he said something to me that I I find quite asinine if i can be so bold to say on a holiday that is easter <laughs> forgive ahead. me 
Um, but the notion that like, he said that it is quite selfish for people who decide not to have children. And I just, I, I found that remark to be so tone deaf considering the person that it comes from, which is Pope Francis mm -hmm. normally is not tone deaf at all mm -hmm. when it comes to how people are and what the needs are for this, you know, for this earth and for this generation. But it's like to say something so like tone deaf, is just like, Okay, people who decide not to have kids are inherently selfish. Yeah. Well, everybody's inherently selfish. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, people people have kids for selfish reasons. Wasn't there a story in the news a few months back of this woman that had like 20 some kids? Like Oh god. Remember? It? Yeah, no. I I as much as I can't connect with this whole idea of like, okay, get this fucking kid away from me, that sort of notion, I similarly cannot stand this like here are my 15 kids that it's all born within just a couple of years from each other. And, uh, yeah, that, that, that'll turn anyone seen articles like that, where it's like, we just had our 22nd kid. That'll turn anyone into an Olivia Coleman, uh, this character. Yeah. So and I, to me, it's like, look, um, but I also just like feel like it's like when you compare Lost Daughter and Come On, Come On side by side, it's like you see two very different pictures here, mm -hmm. but they kind of – there are similarities. Oh, yeah, for sure. There is like carryover. It's like, well, ultimately what you, – you have to as a person in this life decide what's best for you. Mm -hmm. And with Come On, Come On, there will be struggle and there will be hardship, but you will find some satisfaction in the end. With a Lost Daughter – it may very well break you and make your life miserable. And I think ultimately it should telegraph to everybody in the world. You don't have to have children if you don't want to. Yeah. Maybe sometime for a lot of you, it's best you don't. It is best that if you don't want children that you not have them. I think it's very much best. Um, yeah. But I, it, the idea of like societal pressure and societal norms to com to comply to that. Um, that very, very much goes to women and this idea that like they have to be ultra mothery and just in love with their children. No, sometimes they, it's just not that, you know, um, and that's, that's a difficult thing to discuss. Uh, but this film, much respect because it tackles it head on, head, head, head on. Yeah. And clearly in a way that people didn't like <laughs> um, because of how honest it was. Yeah. And that's a whole different thing in and of itself. Um, yeah. So there's that. I think we're done today. Oh, we wow. Go ahead and wrap it up um, just so we can spare, you know, um, Peter the uh, uh, from passing out shall we say uh, yeah. anyway thank you peter for being here um thank you all for listening on red spotlight again we got more content headed your way stay tuned for our top 10 show of the year can't wait and many more reviews um like robert eggers the northman coming at yes. you pretty fucking soon and don't miss if you haven't already listened to it our review for everything everywhere all at once which i have to say i think peter is the single best review you and i have given a movie in our entirety of podcasting so wow big words and I think it's the truth. Um, all right, then. Uh, stay on the rest of the and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.